This conference will now be recorded. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> this is the session we've all been looking for, the last one. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, this your your time today has uh, been helpful so far. I will tell you this one. This session is uh, probably the one that's most. Uh, it's the one I, I have the most passion about, not that I don't care about Medicare or generational differences or quality, but um, I have uh, kind of been a student of leadership uh, throughout my career. I've come to appreciate uh, the what a, a leader does as opposed to um, a, a manager and the, the, the whole aspect of professionalism. Uh, within our uh, arena of post-acute and aging services. And so as you all uh, aspire to become leaders in your own buildings, uh, hopefully this will become uh, something that you can refer to or will inspire you to, uh, to go out and learn more about being a leader. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of managers out there that are being erroneously referred to as leaders. There are also leaders within each of our buildings that uh, that we don't give recognition to because leaders are not just those that are in a position uh, or, or in a position. They are uh, informal leaders. And, and we should be seeking to, to identify who those are within our organizations so that we can uh, help nurture those skills to, to their and our greater benefit. So, so that's what we're going to talk about for the remainder of uh, this afternoon. And so when it comes to the NAB, uh, there's obviously some things that uh, go along with this in terms of uh, leadership and management. So we're going to talk a little bit about some things re relative to time management, uh, to problem solving, uh, cultivating effective relationships, and uh, managing organizational behavior and the change process. So first and foremost is time management. And so what I would, uh, one of the most influential books uh, that I've read, and this is this dates me a little bit, but it still is just as applicable now as it was then, and that's a book called First Things First. And Stephen F. Covey uh, uh, co-wrote this book, and it's where... The, the concept of the quadrant two uh, model originated from. And some of you may uh, remember that, I mean, the, the, the whole uh, four square or quadrant of importance versus urgency. And so this is a, uh, a model that helps us to keep our focus on what activities are going to get us the most uh, bang for our investment of time, but don't necessarily uh, cause us to rush around with our hair on fire, okay? So in terms of time management, and let me see if I can, because I don't think I have this on a, Bear with me here. There we go. Can you all see that? Um, there we go. And so what we have here is the quadrant four model. And so you've got something, things that are both important and urgent, such as crises, medical emergencies, deadline-driven types of projects, 
uh, last minute preparations for scheduled activities, that sort of thing. And then quadrant two is over there on the top right. And those, that's, these are the uh, activities that, this is where, this is where we want to spend our time. This is the area of focus. And so these are things that are important for us or our organizations, but not necessarily urgent. And so this, this is, these are the activities such as preparation and planning, values clarifications, this is, uh, you know, bettering ourselves through exercise, relationship building, and then, you know, true recreation and relaxation, not just, you know, being a couch potato. And so that's, this is the quadrant of quality and personal leadership. Whereas this bottom two quadrants are not important. The quadrant of deception is those things that are seemingly are urgent, but not important. And so they become, uh, it, it deceives us into thinking that we're doing something and being, quote, busy, when in actuality, all it's doing is uh, wasting our time. So things such as some meetings, some interruptions, uh, some calls. Uh, I'm sure all of us can probably attest to having been in some meetings or on some video calls that are uh, less than, uh, you know, that, that are really more of a waste of our time that we could have gotten done in, uh, you know, half or a quarter of the time that the that call or meeting takes. And then, of course, the quadrant of waste, which is over there in the bottom right. And this is just, I mean, just escape activities, mindless stuff. This is the, the where we absolutely don't want to have any of our time going, if we can avoid it at all cost. And so the way that this quadrant works is what you want to do is be able to identify what roles that you play. And this is, this is uh, applicable both on a personal as well as a professional basis. And so devoting some time each week, um, you know, preferably alone so that you have a chance to, to kind of be with yourself and, and have a clear understanding of what your uh, roles that you're going to be playing this over the course of the next week are. Again, quadrant two time management where you're actually preparing and planning and clarifying. And so understanding what those roles are and what your goal is in that role. So as a, uh, maybe as a spouse, you know, in that role, you want to, uh, you know, spend more time with your spouse talking about whatever, uh, the future, talking about your kids, talking about uh, your relationship, I mean, whatever. Uh, maybe in your role as an administrator, uh, maybe you're in your survey window. And so in your role as an administrator, maybe you want to make sure that uh, as a goal that you want to assure that your organization is more prepared than it currently is for surveyors to come in. And so what, what are those activities that you need to spend your time on in that role to assure that, you know, you reach that goal? Okay, so that, that's kind of how it works. So understanding, you know, how you spend your time is dependent on what roles that you're going to play over the course of this next week and then establishing goals for each. And then, you know, how are you going to go about achieving those uh, as necessary? And so does that mean that you're not going to have a, a, a medical emergency or pressing, you know, if you know that you've got a deadline driven project, then theoretically, if you know that you've got it, then you can actually plan for it. And so it becomes not in quadrant one, but it actually, you actually move it over to quadrant two because you're well prepared for it. So I've never been uh someone that is you know uh, 
and I've, I've been in positions where I've had to work 70, 80 hours a week, but I'm not the kind of, uh, I, I don't subscribe to the whole notion that we should simply be on site 50 hours just because that, you know, demonstrates that, you know, you know, we're, you know, we're busy. I'm far more uh, ascribed to working smarter, not necessarily harder. And working smarter means I'm more prepared and I have control of my time instead of letting my time manage me. And this is so critical in your role as an administrator for your building because you're going to have a lot of different time demands. You're going to have a lot of different uh, things coming at you. And so some of which you can't anticipate. And so you're going to spend a little bit of time in Quadrant One because of that, because stuff comes up that you can't anticipate. But the more that you can spend in Quadrant Two, the more prepared you're going to be and the less time is going to end up being wasted. And by the end of that week, you're going to feel more accomplished because you'll have gotten stuff done instead of where did the week go? Okay, if, if there's one thing that I see out there with a lot of new administrators, it's that they they allow their time to manage them. It's sort of like they've got this dog collar on and their time just kind of leads them around, jerks them over here, jerks them over there, and they end up getting burnt out because they don't feel like they have any control. And so, you know, use this model as a way to gain control over your time and if you have control over your time then you have control over the direction that your career and your life can go and if you'd like a copy of, of this particular handout i don't believe i provided it to, to z um, i can get this to z and he can forward it on or you can email me directly Okay. So being a leader is is about being, you know, being self-aware. You know, understanding who you are. You know, you, to nine own self be true. You know, being uh, taking action based on your value set. What that does is it helps develop an atmosphere of trust and as a result it helps build motivation. Now I'll tell you, motivation in, in my estimation does not come from outside. Inspiration comes from outside, motivation comes from within. But it helps to build motivation from with, uh, you know, from within because you have a great, uh, greater, uh, you have a greater degree of trust in the leader of your organization. And it helps, it also positions you to help create partnerships with your team. And quite honestly, uh, it's fundamental to effective communication with others. Because if there's a, a sense of mistrust, then you're, you're not going to, they're always going to be second guessing you. So understanding uh, differences in style and refraining from judging differences uh, are basic tenets uh, underpinning management and leadership. And so your personal style is going to be, uh, I don't know how many of you have taken the, the Myers-Briggs type inventory or the colors. Uh, there's, there's a variety of different models out there to you know, help you better understand your preferences when it comes to your, your personality. And what we have here is, you know, there's four domains, you know, introvert or extrovert, you know, the big picture versus detail orientation, you know, feeler, thinker, and then the present or future orientation. And so normally what I do, uh, I actually teach a, uh, coaching skills uh, curriculum for clients and I utilize this as part of that 
and understanding where you are along the, uh, the continuum on each one of these four domains is, is key to understanding oneself and then understanding and appreciating the differences in others. So what I do is I normally will, in a, in a group setting, when, you know, those back in the old days when we actually got together, I would put a, a line, I'd take a, a line of masking tape, and I would put it on the floor, uh, straight line. And then what I would do is I'd have the group, and I would ask them to uh, place themselves you know, with the extremes being on one on either end. And so, for instance, uh, introvert, extreme introvert would be at one end, extreme extrovert on the other. And then what I would ask them to do is place themselves how they saw themselves as being where they thought they were along the continuum. And I would do this for each one of the, these four domains. And then, what I, and normally these groups are people that know each other, they, they work together, and, and so what I would do is, okay, now look around. And normally what happens is, at least once, uh, what happens is people look around and they say, oh my gosh, I never knew that you saw yourself that way. I always thought you were another way or I didn't realize that you saw yourself that extreme. And, and so what that does is it opens up some dialogue so that you can start to see uh, or appreciate the fact that sometimes the way other people see us is not the way we see ourselves. And if we can get to that point, then we can open our minds to the fact that just because I see somebody a certain way, doesn't mean that they see themselves the same way. And so an appreciation of those differences can be cultivated and then we can make true progress in our, our ability to work together and communicate. And that's key from a leadership perspective. Communication. Communication can come in multiple forms. And I'm sure, especially during this pandemic and working virtually, uh, we, we've all been subjected to that. And so, you know, whether it's written, electronic, uh, you know, visual, but there's also verbal and nonverbal. And so how many of you have been on a Zoom call or go to meeting or whatever, and you've had your webcam on and I, I don't know about you, but I, I enjoy kind of watching expressions of people's faces. There's a lot of nonverbal communication that can come across just simply by observing. And there's also nonverbal signals or messages that are sent. Little aside, I referenced earlier my first administrator gig was uh, that, that building that the Teamsters had tried to organize. They weren't successful, by the way. And <clears throat> the reason that I was in that role is because the administrator that I was there to assist as an AIT had resigned. And I went into that office and it spoke volumes, especially of where that building was at that time. Every conceivable piece of furniture that could be between his chair and the door to his office was was in between him and that door. And what that told me that is he was he had put up a fortress, barriers. He didn't he was he was fortifying his position. And that spoke volumes to me. That he had he was there was it was him and then there was everybody else. And so the first thing that I did when I got into that office was I removed everything and left nothing between me and the door. And what that did non-verbally was let people know that I'm open, that I, you, know, you can come in and talk to me about anything at any time. So 
verbal communication skills involve a lot of different things. Paraphrasing. Now, many of us know paraphrasing to be basically repeating what we hear. And to a degree, that's right. But what we're doing is we're not parroting back that message verbatim. What we're doing is we are paraphrasing by saying, okay, what I hear you saying is, and then you use your own words. And that allows the, the person who spoke to verify and validate that, yes, you heard what they were saying. And so you are effective listening. There's also encouraging, asking clarifying questions. Clarifying questions are not questions that can be answered by yes or no. Yes or no questions are very closed because a yes or no answer and you have no place to go from there. So a clarifying question is, tell me more about, it asks for more information and it keeps the dialogue going and it helps you from a problem solving perspective to move in the direction where you can collectively problem solve. Framing, uh, you know, describing an overall picture, uh, using images. Uh, it, it looks like, I mean, I, I've learned with my uh, right brain wife, I being a left brain husband, that the way I would describe something when I'm giving her directions is I've learned my lesson the hard way that I can't tell her go one fourth of a mile down the road and make a right and go, you know, go half a mile and then make a left. What I have to do with her is I have to say, okay, you go down to the second stop sign and make a right, and then you go down to the Dairy Queen and make a left. Okay, I'm using more visual, I'm in images, because that's the way she interprets and prefers to interpret data. And so how do you know that? Well, you've got to understand where they're coming from. So that does take a little bit of effort. And so normally when we're together, what we do is we have a, a communication game. And this is something that you can actually use back in your buildings. What you do is <clears throat> you can take, um, and, and I've got actual uh, figures or pictures. This is something, again, that you can, uh, I, I can send to you if you want. And what this does is it allows you to take you know, I divide everybody up into pairs, and I say, okay, who is going to be the director? And so whoever raises their hand as director, and then I give them a copy of the picture. And then these pairs, of course, are sitting back to back. And so the other individual is the implementer. And so they have a blank sheet of paper and something to write with. And then the idea here is for the director and the implementer to work together to recreate whatever the director's picture is on the implementer's page. Okay, and so that's the communication game. And what that does is, and of course, usually this is in uh, the, the boardroom there at the uh, at AU, and so you've got a lot of different people all in the room, and they're all talking, so you've got a, a, a noise level. And so the whole idea here is, is and then afterwards, we, we all come back together and we you know, collectively show the pictures and then see how close everybody got. The point being here is that communication is sometimes fraught with uh, things that, that conspire to keep us from being heard. Sometimes it's the sheer noise of the environment. Sometimes it's the noise of what's going on within the the relationship. There may be some mistrust. Um, yeah, there may be some conflict. Uh, there may be some distraction. And, and so being able to 
understand and appreciate how to effectively communicate and, and basically gauge how effective you are as a communicator is this is this what is this game helps draw some of that out and so again that's something that we normally do within uh, when we're all together unfortunately that's something we can't do here <laughs> so I, I kept it in the slides just to be able to describe it to you because it is it's a fun uh, way of uh, helping people kind of loosen up and understand that communication is not as easy as one thinks Self-management, uh, understanding that you can only control your own emotional responses to a situation and having ability to pull back as necessary so that you can gain your emotion con emotional control. Uh, what that does is it allows you to be more effective as a listener and a communicator. And so pullback strategies, I mean, everybody has their buttons, okay? Uh, I would hearken to say that your your children definitely know what your buttons are, and if you're in a management capacity, your employees probably know a couple of them too. Um, and so whether you know it or not, they know what your buttons are. And if you don't know what your buttons are, they still know what your buttons are. So it's to your advantage to better understand what are those things that trigger you from an emotional perspective and then understand, okay, when that happens, what can I do to pull back so that I can still keep an open mind and be able to listen and communicate, even in a stressful situation. <coughs> Excuse me. So you've got two options. You can either respond based on emotion, and in that case, what you're doing is basically defending your opinion, uh, and instead of listening, preparing what you're going to say after that person stops talking. And many times that exchange is emotionally based. You're each looking for your own evidence to support your side, and you're discounting evidence to the contrary. Now, we have a presidential debate tonight. Now, based on the previous debate, how do you th do you think they have pullback strategies? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. And so, you know, no communication is going on there. All they're doing is trying to defend their their uh, perspective. And so, th there is no debate uh, or no communication going on. Or you can pull back from your emotions, suspend your own opinion, put them on hold, and then actively listen, listen without any blocks or judgment. What that does is it allows you to engage in some non-charged dialogue. It may actually, uh, you know, inspire you to change your position because of some new information or insights. So, and at the end of the day, though, by pulling back from your emotions and allowing you to keep an open mind and open ears, both parties end up feeling heard and it sets you on the right path towards being able to resolve differences or solve a problem. So Webster's Dictionary defines manage <clears throat> in terms of the difference between management and leadership. So the definition of manage is to make and keep compliant, to exercise executive, administrative, and supervisory direction of. And I've bolded to make and keep compliant. So manage is control, okay? Whereas lead, and some people actually believe that management and leadership are interchangeable. Lead, however, is to guide on a way, especially by going in advance, to direct on a course or in a direction. So, whereas manage implies more about control, lead tends to be more about, you know, visioning, setting 
setting uh, the organization on the right course and you know putting the organization and looking out there and you heard me earlier talk about being a scout one of the roles in, in controlling quality is understanding what's on the horizon and so guiding on a way so being able to look beyond your immediate situation and understand what is possible and how you can maybe go about getting there Management versus leadership. Management involves planning, budgeting, organizing and staffing, controlling and problem solving. Okay, all of those are more nuts and bolts in nature. Nothing wrong with it, but that's more about the whole control. Okay, leadership, however, is more about, as I said, establishing that direction or vision. It allows you to think more holistically and allows you to align people and put them in the right position to be successful. And then it allows you as a leader to inspire them so that they become motivated to do better, to do more, to you know better understand their role and be better, more, a more full contributor to the success of your organization. So management produces a degree of predictability and order, has potential to consistently produce short-term results that your stakeholders expect. Manage or leadership, however, can produce change often more to a dramatic degree and has the potential to produce uh, change that is innovative. For example, things that uh, you know, doing ways a different way or something completely that uh, different that your organization hasn't done before. For example, maybe a, a different service line. Uh, maybe you haven't done, um, you know, maybe you haven't done respite care before, or maybe you haven't done uh, a specialty type of therapy. Uh, there's a variety of things, but you have to be open-minded enough to consider what those possibilities may be. So leadership defined, again, are those moments when individuals work together to create change for the common good. And so those moments are episodic. They, they're, they're very, you know, they're just, they're finite. But they also are, are relational, meaning they're, they are respectful of, uh, you know, a, a relationship that exists between those parties. They're focused on change for the better. And you know, more from a, a, a global perspective, they enhance the community or the, the greater good. And so that's what leadership is, is about. It's, it's about making things better for everybody. It's not just an individual. You, I heard, uh, you, I talked earlier today about a book called Leading Change, and this is uh, by John Cotter, and this, this is something that comes from that book. And this is the relationship of leadership management versus results and transformation. And so what we have here is an axis that shows leadership on the X and management on the Y. And showing that with no leadership or management going on, you can see transformation, transformation efforts go nowhere. I mean, the, the, the organization is just dead in the water. And so if you enhance the organization through, you know, good leadership, then transformation efforts can be successful for a while, but often fail after short-term res results become erratic. Why is that? Because you've got somebody there who's, who's thinking, visioning, leading, uh, you know, thinking about the future, but they're not tending to the day-to-day -day operational stuff, okay? Conversely, if you've got somebody who is focusing just on those, you know, daily operational things, so you've got a lot of management, not but not anybody thinking about the, the future, 
that'll get you down the road a little ways. Short-term results are possible, uh, especially through things like cost-cutting mergers, acquisitions, that sort of thing. But real transformation has a lot of trouble getting started, and major long-term change is very rarely achieved simply because you're not looking to the future, you're looking at the here and now. And so you have to have a relationship that is complementary between leadership and management. And when you do, and this, and I'm, what I'm talking about is, you know, one and the same. You can have, uh, you can wear both of these hats as one person. Or you can have organizations where somebody is more focused in that area and you've got somebody else where their strength is more on the management side. Either way, a good complement of leadership and management focus can build highly successful organizations because you've combined both good leadership and good management. So the leadership challenge, Kuzis and Posner, uh, again, one of the most influential books I've ever read. Uh, part of that is they, they wanted to look at the characteristics of exemplary leaders. And so what they did is they did this survey of a, uh, a large sample size. And what they found is that most people follow leaders who are 90% said we like to follow somebody who's honest. 75% we want somebody who is looking forward. We want somebody out there who is leading us. They're, they're looking to the future. They, they're not just spending time here and now. They want to know and they want to see what we can be. And so doing, they also look to somebody who can inspire them. They also, again, they, they expect competency, but only at 63%. So they are far more inclined to follow someone who is more visionary and is honest in their communications with their team. More so than whether they are truly competent. So some key distinctions about leadership. First of all, it's presence. It's not personality. And just because you've got the title doesn't mean you're a leader. So don't, you know, just because you may have the, the, the office or the, the name tag that says you're the administrator, that doesn't mean you're the leader. You've got to have a presence about you that and you've got means you have to be visible and engage with people. The leadership's a relationship. It's about trust and confidence. Because if you don't have the people aren't going to be willing to take risks. And if you don't have people willing to take risks, then things are not going to change. And of course without change, things don't move along. Organizations and movements die. So it's all about relationships. It's not the private reserve of a few charismatic people. It's not something you're born with. It's a process that people, ordinary people, use when they're bringing forth the best from others. So find ways to liberate the leader in everyone, and extraordinary things can happen. Leadership is something that can be taught. In fact, everyone can learn leadership. It's about knowledge, skills, and value. You know, education, having a, an understanding about, you know, what leadership is and how it can be used, how it should be used. You know, training is an acquisition of those skill sets. That's the difference, education versus training, understanding versus acquiring skill sets, and developing that through practice and ongoing reflection. You've got to take some time. And part of that is, you know, when we talked earlier about time management, that 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 personal time that you know you should take on a weekly basis, that's a great time to reflect. How am I doing? 
what is what are the areas that I'm still frustrated with? What are the areas that I would like to continue to uh, you know make headway on? And then actually taking that information and then applying it in your interactions that you have with others in your organization. That's engagement. Who's this Posner talk about the five essential practices of effective leaders? That's challenging the process, inspiring a shared vision, enabling others to act, modeling the way, and encouraging the heart. And we're going to talk about each one of these. Kuzis and Posner found that, as I've said, great leadership is relationship-based. Uh, you bring out, as a good leader or a great leader, you bring out the leadership in others. You help others to shine and not just yourself. And there's a skill set that can be learned, practiced, and developed. As I said, leaders are not born, they are made. So the 10 commitments of leadership. Two, under challenge the process. One is search for opportunities to challenge the process. If you're new to your organization, then I would highly suggest that you spend the first two weeks on the job simply hanging out in the center, engaging with people, asking questions, asking, say, you know, if you observe a specific uh, process, just say, you know, ask, why do we do it this way? And many times you might find that the answer is, is oh, either they just completely flatline or because we've always done it this way. Well, there's an opportunity. And so you make notes and then you can come back and say, hey, you know, what if we did this? You know, and that's where you start to experiment and take risks. So you can see success doesn't breed success. It breeds failure. Failure which is what breeds success. You have to take some risks. You have to fail. What was it that uh, Alexander Graham Bell uh, or Thomas Edison? Thomas Edison failed. Or somebody said, uh, you failed 10,000 times before you figured out how to what, uh, develop the light bulb. He says, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I found 10,000 ways not to do it. And so that's what we've got to be willing to do is to put ourselves out there both individually and as an organization to figure out better ways to do it. This kind of dovetails very well into the whole QI mindset. Inspiring shared vision. One is you have to be able to envision the future. What does the future look like? You are applying what you know about what's happened in the past to the present, but then taking that and say, okay, that's happened in the past, here's where we are now, but where does that leave us next year and five years? That's where you have to, as the leader, start developing that orientation for the future so that you can inspire a shared vision with those and by enlisting others in that. That doesn't mean that it stays exactly like that, but by enlisting others, it allows them to contribute and because you all have discovered a common purpose. And so that vision becomes to take uh, even greater shape when others have an opportunity to contribute to it. By enabling others to act, what that means is you're fostering collaboration. You're putting uh, a lot of trust in people. Uh, you're develop, helping them to develop cooperative goals for how you want to move forward, whether it be things such as you know, staffing, clinical care delivery, customer satisfaction, financial, whatever. You're working together on cooperative goals and uh, allowing others to take you know, uh, a role in that process. What that does is it helps strengthen them because you're sharing information and, and power with them. You're, allow, you're increasing the, the level of discretion and visibility that they have. And as a result, you're helping to make heroes of others within your organization. 
they all feel better about themselves and the role that they play, and they have a better understanding of the role that they have within the greater uh, mission, vision, and values of your organization. By modeling the way, what that means is you're walking the talk. You're setting the example. I mean, everybody should have that 30 minute, what I call an elevator speech. You know, that, that 30 second, you know, little spiel about, you know, who you are, what you do, where you do it at, and why you do it. Those, those, that's those moments of truth. And that's a, a subtle way of communicating messages. You know, those those little informal talks, you know, uh, I when I was uh, as an administrator, I would, uh, you know, our laundry room was, was kind of cut off from the rest of uh, the building. And I would go out and I would spend time with uh, the ladies within the laundry because, you know, I didn't want them to feel like that they were completely shut off from the rest of the organization. You know, find ways to plan small wins, as I was talking about earlier today. You know, find, don't, you know, begin with the end in mind, but find ways to set little, you know, tick marks for, okay, when we get to this point, that way small wins helps promote consistent progress and it helps people say, hey, we're making headway and it builds commitment and people's commitment gains strength uh, the more, uh, the more wins that you see. And encouraging the heart means recognizing individual contr contributions. And that doesn't necessarily mean, it can mean simply, you know, uh, you know, calling someone, uh, recognizing someone in public at like a staff meeting. It could be uh, using a variety of rewards such as, you know, hey, you know, saw you did, you know, went above and beyond on this. Hey, have a have a Snickers bar or here's a granola bar, whatever. And then celebrating those accomplishments. You know, Ken Blanchard, author of The One Minute Manager said, we always praise in public and criticize in private. And so what we want to do is we want to toot people's horn in public in a great way, but it ha can't be just canned. It's got to be very personal and sincere. And so it might be something as I used to, um, everybody in my organization, I had a list of when their birthday was. And each week I would get the list of whose birthday it was that week. And then I would write a personal note in a birthday card and I would mail it to their home. And that, what that, and you know, that may have been the only birthday card they got. But what it was is it put me in a position where I got to know them a little bit better and it let me communicate that I truly appreciated what they were doing and, you know, allowed me to, to give them a personal message. And I can't tell you how many of the staff would come back on the, the following week and say, I really appreciated, you know, you know, like I said, maybe that was the only birthday card they got that year. Encouragement is feedback. And feedback, according to Ken Blanchard, is the breakfast of champions. And so feedback is, it should be uh, honest, it should be immediate, and should be encouraging. Some thoughts on professionalism. First of all, as you heard me say earlier, you cannot have respect until you have self-respect. And so you can't respect others until you respect yourself. And so you've got to understand what your your uh, your limits are and what you are, you know, at, but at the same time be willing to push yourself. Secondly, be about the profession. We are a profession. We are not just a job. We have a, if, if you view this uh, perspective uh, role as just simply a, uh, a a better job, then I would encourage you to to really second guess yourself on that. We this is a profession. We should also have a uh, appreciation and strive to have a good work life balance. 
as I've said, there are going to be those times when you're going to be required to, to be at the center a, an inordinate amount of time. And there may be a variety of reasons. You know, COVID may be, you know, at the top of that list. But we should also, after those times are over, be willing to, you know, give back to our own selves, to our families, to our kids, the time that we were away dealing with things that are work-related. We should be seek to be transparent. As I said, we should be willing to walk the talk and be willing to be called upon it if we're not. I mean, that's part of leadership. People should be feel comfortable enough to call you on something if you're not walking the talk, as I said. Professional development. I know Z has probably talked to you a little bit about uh, the American College of Healthcare Administrators. American College is the only association devoted to you as the individual administrator. Professional development opportunities abound. We, of course, uh, have historically had numerous opportunities in person, but we also have a number of webinars um, that cover a variety of topics, and they're all free to members. Uh, each one of those webinars uh, allows you to earn, um, I think, 1.25 hours of CE, but moreover, it's an opportunity to develop yourself professionally. It's not just about collecting the hours. Appearance. Appearance is something that's important to me because, as I said, this is a profession, and we don't want our profession to be seen as people who aren't, uh, who don't have enough self-respect to dress appropriately. So I'm not saying necessarily wear the, the suit and tie every day or the, the, you know, the suit for the ladies, but I'm also saying don't wear the sweatshirt and the, the, the halter tops and, and all this other stuff. Self-respect. So take in consideration the impact your appearance has on others. And then again, Clint Mon, uh, another saying that he, another quote is, you know, the best solution to any problem is closest to the problem itself. And so strive to keep the, the solution as close to where the problem is identified. That's where you're going to get the best solution. So if it's, uh, if the problem is on the front line, then the solution should, you know, you should encourage and develop problem solving skills with your team so that they can come up with the best solution, not you. You're not the first step to the kingdom and wearing the flowing white robes. Okay. As I said, we are in a profession. It's not just an occupation. And if you view it in that concept, uh, it can be explained as a group's collective effort to pursue uh, a learned art with common calling to act in the spirit of public good. And as professionals, we make a bargain with society for which they're promised to serve the public interest. We are in return granted certain privileges, such as exclusive right to perform certain functions or other special status, i.e., we have a license. Guess what? Hospital administrators don't have a license. We do. That's because we are a profession and we've made a bargain with society um, to work towards giving the best care to their loved ones and the greater good of our communities. I like this uh, quote, it says the challenge for leaders is to go beyond focus on day to day <clears throat> management concerns and crisis and focus on the larger purpose of work. Yes, budgets have to be balanced and paper has to be pushed, but that's the easy part. Deeper and more important task is to give passionate, relentless attention to mission and purpose, continually seeking ways to offer the gift of significance. That's powerful stuff, guys. And so lastly, uh, I'm going to try and show you a video here.
Bob, there's no sound. There's no sound? No. Okay. They're going to go on that URL and let them watch it on their own, I think. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thought I could uh, use it. So you've got the URL there. And so Simon Sinek is a, uh, uh, I just love listening to him because he's got great messages. Uh, he's talking, he, a, a previous video, which I'm sure Z has probably shown you as, as the golden circle. Well, this is about the circle of trust. And so I would encourage you to go to this link and uh, watch it. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful message uh, from Simon Sinek. So we are right at three o'clock. Uh, what kind of questions, observations, thoughts, jokes do, do you all have? Was this helpful? What can we do better? <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, what I will do is I will uh, I will send Z the uh, quadrant four and uh, some uh, the stuff for the communication game, and I'll let you know, Z distribute it accordingly. I'd like to thank you all. Uh, I know this this type of format is uh, pretty challenging, um, especially if, if you know me and Z does, and he knows that uh, I much prefer to be in front of people. Um, but at the same time, you know, I recognize that there are limitations uh, because of the pandemic, and of course, right now with uh, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to Pam and uh, her husband as they. Uh, uh, deal with, uh, you know, getting through this COVID. So I wish the best to all of you and, uh, you know, invite you to, to contact me uh, if you've got questions or if I can be of any help uh, in the future. I would certainly encourage you to, uh, to give some thought to becoming a, a member of the American College. It is your profession, it is your, your society. And, uh, I hope to see you along uh, long the long the road uh, in the future. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all.